Welcome. This is the August 6th Jail and Zones production user call. We have Carlo, Jan, Jamie, and myself, Michael. And I have a broad comment that is not aimed at anyone present, which is, hey, everyone keep it actionable. I'm getting a lot of comments on social media that aren't very actionable. And there's a great saying by Theodore Roosevelt, which is complaining about a problem without proposing a solution is called whining. So another <laughs> point of order, if you put a, if you put a topic on the uh, agenda, please put your name with it, and I will punch through some news and we'll do an introduction. Fosse US just took place in Portland, Oregon. It was a great conference and it's put on by the Self for Freedom Conservancy. I gave two talks, one on long term communities. I have never had more people come up to me after a talk and ask questions and thank me. And I gave a talk about uh, FreeBSD on ARM64. So hopefully those will get published soon. I do have recordings if that doesn't happen. And as of 0910 oh, a.m. Pacific, the Open ZFS User and Developer Summit is officially open for registration and sponsorship. I've been helping organize that and preparing all the documents, logos, etc. There is a link there that you may follow that is in Portland, Oregon at the end of October. Anyone in Oregon? I think one. Links, they are in the doc. Jan, let me drop them in there. Copy and boom. Uh, let's see, unless you meant for the event, but uh, fossi.us is the main page. Anyway, uh, I'll just go with some links that Chris dropped in earlier and never quite made it into calls. Uh, let's see, Chris uh, M gave us a link to a document of a PDF of jail versus Docker and performance. Uh, take a peek at that, it's in the doc here. And also a link to Robo Nuggie's post on things that free BSD needs. Hmm, maybe that inspired my comment from Theodore Roosevelt, but one of them was jail management. Well, there are many options such as life. And uh, he also posted Doug Robson's talk up from, I believe, the Container Summit. So there's a YouTube link there. And a comment, uh, oh, that's from me, uh-oh. So at some point in the future, I'd love to know if there's more to discuss on jail uptime, such that if you run the uptime command inside a jail, does it show the host? Does it show the jail? Is there any way to keep track of that? Um, uh, Jamie and Jan, if that's been the in the back of your head and you have a new idea, go ahead and share it right now. Otherwise, it can just kind of be saved here in the minutes. Uh, show the It's post. been in the back of my head, but not with any um, ideas, just okay. as a thing probably ought to be done. Jails, cool. Maybe uh, a bit late, but why? What real world problem is this solving? <laughs> uh, a jail is trying to give the illusion of an independent system that's you know not on the host, and you may care that you have the actual uptime of, of a jail during I don't know a CI run or something. So there there was a discussion a few months ago. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I I've, was part of the discussion, but I wasn't convinced then either. Okay. Fair enough. Hey, and I will move on to Nick's topic here. He might join us. He's got some package-based news for Jailer. And welcome, Carlo. Would you like to talk about what you're working on and what questions you have? Uh, hello. Uh, so uh, it's my first time here. Uh, I'm, I'd say, just a regular FreeBSD user. Uh, I use it in my own lab and... Uh, my first exposure to FreeBSD was actually in university, but not directly. They didn't tell us we we're using FreeBSD or <laughs> anything. Uh, they used this tool uh, called uh, Immunes uh, to simulate networks. And uh, it's a really great tool. It's like a, a Tickle uh, a tool with a, a GUI that uh, allows you to easily uh, describe uh, topologies, network topologies, and uh, see what's happening. Uh, I can drop a link if you Yeah, that'd want. be great. Now, always have your links uh, ready, because if you have, if something's of interest to you, it's probably interesting to the rest of us. Go ahead. Uh, OK, uh, let me just awesome. find where the chat is. OK, here. Uh, awesome. And uh, yeah, that's my first exposure. And I started using it uh, in 13. Point zero as a firewall and router, and I fell in love with its features like uh, Z uh, ZFS and uh, Jails and uh, NetGraph. Uh, so uh, I, whoa, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll drop it in there. Go ahead, go ahead with your question. Uh, yeah, uh, I have uh, two questions uh, for today. 
Uh, one is uh, a bit more general. Uh, if you want, I can lead with that. Or yeah, uh, please. One Your okay. charge. Uh, so the general uh, question is: uh, Could uh, delegated uh, root uh, for uh, jails uh, ZFS uh, uh, dataset be a root for the jail? Uh, one second. Uh, could how would I uh, express it uh, so that a jail I create has a uh, root as a Z ZFS dataset that is delegated to it? As, as far, far as I know, know, that is explicitly disallowed. Yeah, I know. But uh, I wanted to ask uh, if that would be feasible to express like in the future, because I'd like to create uh, some tests with uh, uh, backups and stuff like that uh, where the root is uh, ZFS data set that I can manage within the jail. So that's a host route? Uh, so you want what? A, a path yeah. for the jail. Yeah. It's not mounted oh. on the route, but it's so, just a data set that is delegated. So you want the root directory of the jail to be a delegated ZFS file system? Yeah. I mean, there is also a I problem. How would you possible. describe uh, other mounts like uh, DevFS and stuff like that? Um, um, the problem is uh, the host will not mount the uh, delegated file system, and to create the jail, you need the mount point. Yeah. Um, so you get into. I don't know if the kernel, if you get clever and try to uh, cheat, if you can mount on top of, uh, let's say, another FS or something. Uh, maybe Jamie can tell us. But for backup purposes, there's no reason why you have to be, and I would even say it's a bad idea to have the root of your receive jail be uh, delegated. No, it, it's not uh, for the receive side, it's for the send side. Oh. Uh, why, why I wanted to do that? I wanted to create a uh, mm -hmm. lab for people to teach uh, that uh, replicates the uh, bare metal uh mm -hmm. topology as much as it can uh okay um and it's root on zfs uh yeah in uh, that case probably <clears throat> i mean i can do without that i just wanted on the to side show side, an idea. okay that makes kind of sense so if what's you unique about the data set manage, it's root file system but uh i think for safety reasons uh but it's not possible because there uh, are be dragons. Yeah. So just and there's no also... way to uh, say just send and not receive. I mean, either you're delegating management or you're not. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, if you like, had a way to specify uh, just the ZFS data set instead of uh, a normal path, uh, you would have a problem of how do you mount uh, DevFS and other file systems on top because but... the jail cannot mount uh, the devfs itself as far as i know no it, it can if it has permission to to do so oh oh okay right but the um you may be able to have an empty directory create the jail and then do the delegation stuff and so on in the exec dot created hook oh i did not think about that i did not think so then about you have it. an empty jail and before it tries to do anything in that, uh, I use that to uh, automate file system mounting and unmounting, for example. You can mount uh, to root uh, after that, right? After um, you delegate uh, the... I'm the gonna try it today. The key probably. part here is that the jail, um, the created hook runs on the host, so it's not jailed. So in the... you only need the directory to run the, to create an empty jail. And before you try to run anything from it, because the um, start no is present. the first one to run inside of the jail. So yeah. as long as the file system is populated and mounted by that time, you're fine. And because the jail already exists during the uh, created hook, you can use jxec in your hook script. Yeah, I'm probably going to well, use uh, C for that. Runs, but, um... So the file system is not a problem. I can do anything from uh, C. 
from created uh, or but the proper way would be uh, during the prepare a hook even earlier uh, to mount something like DevFS. Of course, that doesn't help you if you want to mount um, the root file system later when the jail is already created. In that case, um, yeah, you would have to mount the DevFS in the created. And here, a uh, hack you can use is to use a here doc in your shell script uh, which contains a file system table fs top, which you then pipe into the auto mounting logic of the mount command so that it uh, is resilient if the file system is still mounted and nothing has to be done. Wow. Because the, if you use the uh, mount or fs top directly from jl.conf, it's not smart enough because it feeds its each line individually into the mount command, it stumbles if the mount points are already mounted. Okay, thank you. I, I uh, don't think you this will work though. Oh, I'm not sure either. I'm just saying that the, you can try, but it's because not going to work with the config out of a box. When you create a jail, it stores in the kernel, the V node for the jails root. So if you mount on top of it, that vnode is mounted on top, and in a path search, oh. the the mounted over vnode will get. But I've just got a vnode pointer that uh, if you enter the jail, it's going to do that, and I don't think that is going to uh, do any mounted on. I'm not sure. So but I'm over mounting the jail would so could be a really terrible idea. Okay, <laughs> if you can even do that. We look forward to hearing what your science results in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm going to test it Please. and see. Cool. Did we you have, have a, a related question? open security issue. Mm. Uh, yeah, I heard about that. Uh, you saw that. Comparison. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's in the public back tracker. <laughs> so. Uh, also, I uh, uh, just uh, remember to tell you uh, the uh, link you I posted uh, about the tool, Immunes. Uh, do not run it on 14.0 if you run ZFS oh, because there is a bug in UnionFS that will create uh, directories uh, which are and files which are not uh, addressable by uh, user land. Uh, paths will have slashes inside of them because of a bug in UnionFS. Uh, let's take a look at that page and maybe. No, 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 we'll it, uh, it works on 14.1, not on 14.0. Oh, 14. 14. 14. Not 14. oh, thank you. Let me fix that. Okay, we'll take a I, look. Uh, look I reported those bugs and they were fixed. Excellent. So it works on 14.1. Okay, so let's take a look. Immune, because I have not heard of that. Maybe others have. Uh, you so... can have uh, open its uh, immunes.net. Uh, there is an image of a topology and how it looks. Uh, oh, there is. Okay. Um... It's like 20 years old, uh, the tool. Really? Hey, you mentioned it in college from some time ago. Yeah. There we go. Let's zoom in on that. Okay. Cool. Last commit an hour ago, so it's still not an active <laughs> development, I would say. Yeah. Welcome, I, Daniel. Uh, We're going through a number of things with a new uh, attendee. So, a cool. colleague at work is a maintainer, and uh, I give him ideas to what to do next and uh, what Very to cool. be fixed and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, uh, that I hope will get. Uh, means more attention that is quite cool um and, yeah so uh, let's all digest that and did you have another question yeah i have another yeah. question uh, so uh, i created a netgraph node and i have uh, some trouble proper, properly expressing uh, it uh, within the system of netgraph so uh, the problem uh, is arising from the fact that the user cannot speak directly about vnets, rather only jails uh, with like jail IDs and jail names. Mm -hmm. And uh, vnets have no concept of being nested. So uh, here's a link to the code I created. It is a, a NetGraph node that acts uh, exactly like a hub, but it can be delegated to a root, uh, to, root to a uh, child jail. And uh, what I want to use it for is uh, if you have a beehive uh, 
VM on your host with a NetGraph uh, interface that does not uh, need to be uh, like uh, an Ethernet interface. And I want uh, to be able to delegate uh, like its communication to a jail, which is running uh, the uh, rest of the network experiment uh, within the uh, immune tool I showed you earlier. Uh, so my uh, my solution, the best solution I found, it's not uh, in the code committed yet, but the best solution I found is to have the uh, node after its creation be unclaimed and uh, let uh, the node be claimed uh, by a jail which is inside of its VNet. And after, the, uh, after that, the uh, jail... Uh, you know, you can send the node a message to uh, push itself to a child VNet. It's not a child VNet, it's a child jail, which uh, has another VNet. And uh, then it creates a, a VNet, uh, VNet hub uh, node uh, inside of the child jail. Uh, that is, I mean, that is fine, but somebody can uh, send a claim message after you create the node and before you can take it some other jail which is not uh, yours but it shares uh, the same vnet can claim it and uh, use it yeah uh, in the code there it is assumed that the first uh, jail I, uh, jail you encounter recursively which shares the same vnet is the jail which uh, created the node I don't know if okay. there is a better solution. It, uh, I couldn't think of it. So um, there already is an ng uh, hub netgraph node in base. Yeah, I know there is an ng hub, but I want to be able to push it into another vnet and communicate uh, between vnets with the netgraph so, node. Uh, couldn't you use something uh, existing? Hub and then attach either Ethernet interfaces or pipes? Uh, yeah, I think I can, but uh, I do not need the upper hook, do I, of that uh, Ethernet inter interface. And uh, okay. it seems to me like uh, oh, it is going through so an unne unnecessary to... part of the code uh, to just yeah. get the communication between VNets. Like, I don't really need the, the interface code for that, just netgraph. Daniel, welcome, author of Netgraph Buddy. Any insight into Carlo's challenge? He doesn't have a question, he just joined. Oh, I know. Well, he joined a minute ago. Um, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I heard that. That's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, to do to do that, I guess what I'm doing is I'm just burying multiple EI faces and use them sort of as individual hubs. But I guess you can't span that between. Well, I guess I don't I don't know. Yeah, I mean I I can get by for now with uh, you know like uh, just uh, having uh, the Beehive use uh, normal interface. And uh, it will appear as a, uh, I think, ngf ether or something, and I can just uh, push it uh, with uh, uh, ifconfig uh, vnet. Uh, but I didn't really want to force it to be like an Ethernet interface. Right. Right. So that Beehive makes what? What does what does Beehive make? Like a ng socket device or something. Uh, yeah, so, it is the NG yeah. socket. So there's not much you could do with that. Uh, all right, nice. I mean, the code above works, but uh, it has the problem of uh, assuming the first JLIT encounters is the one that created it. And NG nodes have no concept of uh, JLs, just VNets. And users cannot speak about VNets. That's the like the core of the problem. Right. Yeah. It's Jan, that really, sounds uh, a bit like your Vert IO SCSI CTL devices where you have to limit who gets access to what or else game over from yeah, a security perspective. That's, no? 
It does, and in that case, you have a problem. But the problem is a bit different because you're in a different namespace. Mm. But in both cases, it would really help if you have a never reused kind of numerical identifier, not just a pointer to a struct VNet or a struct prison, but uh, a numeric handle, which, yeah, uniquely identifies that JL and is never reused over the system runtime. So basically, a jail ID which never overflows. Of course, you can't promise that with 32 bit. Hmm. Mm, so, yeah. Something like a kernel assigned uh, jail UUID or something. Uh, and then you know. And associate the two from there. Hmm? And you associate the. Uh, yeah, or for system. performance reason, uh, realistically, you would probably make it a 64-bit integer, uh, just an atomic counter. Uh, because if you yeah overflow 64-bit counter intentionally, you don't uh, you obviously don't have uh, useful things to do. Hmm. Okay, that's a bit cheeky, but yeah. The nice thing is that a 64-bit integer is a bit. So starts out smaller and um, can be handled more efficiently. And we have atomic operations on pairs of them and so on, whereas you don't have quad with uh, atomic operations normally. Yeah. Jamie, any observations or thoughts on this whole notion? Oh, there's been occasional calls for a permanent jail ID and yeah I don't see anything more than a 64 bit number being needed understood so and Carlos it sounds like you have a workaround but not quite a long term safe one yeah I mean it will, it will work for my lab because I'm the only one running it but right. uh, um, I'd rather be it be like secure uh, yeah. You know, type your own NGV net hub. Yeah. Uh, Note type is um, it. If I remember correctly, netgraph notes take a message on creation, so you can have an initial configuration, right? Yeah, I I didn't check if that I get the message uh, first, if and then the I get the create message. Say, okay. Is there something you can put in that message? to validate against the claim. Oh, I did not uh, think about that. So I'm that gonna you have can to say something like, my VNet uh, must be have this jail name or this jail ID. You yeah. put it in and uh, basically you refuse all others. Yeah, that, that would help. And then you, yeah, it's a bit annoying. You first have to create the VNet. So you have to create the jail with the VNet attached to it, then create the ngvnet, and you could just have messages to add or remove or replace the, if you make it a set, you can then even have the host put itself in first. Yeah, no, uh, I already uh, create it, and then I you assume the host add put itself. VNets, which are allowed to manage this node or something. So I, I assume annoying. the host adds itself, and I have a message which says uh, to clone itself to a uh, nested VNet. Mm -hmm. So uh, just the host would be would need to specify its uh, jail ID in the creation message if it can. Yep. I did not uh, check for that, uh, but also refuse the after... claim if there's a callback right, gonna... for you to do the access mm -hmm. control. But if there is, I mean potentially uh... as a Break around, you would have to do a permission check on every call, other callback, which would be ugly, but hey. Uh, well, after the host claims it, it can, after you create it in a uh, jail, you can mm -hmm. uh, push it to a, a child VNet. But when you push it to a child VNet, I... let him finish, let him finish. Uh, ahead, when you uh, push it to a, another VNet, I expect that the VNet has uh, like the same uh, 
uh, permissions as the host does because now it has the same node and it can push it to its children. But that side is not the problem. The problem is how do I determine which uh, jail ID uh, was the you know uh, host jail? Uh, it's the uh, function uh, vnet to prison, I think uh, I called it, and it just assumes the first one uh, is the one. Uh, so the solution you proposed with the creation message, uh, having a host jail ID, that would be perfect if I can go with that. I'm not sure if it's possible. Uh, I will just check if the jail specified is the same vnet as the... Oh, it's actually not that... Good, because uh, if I check that it's the same vnet as uh, the uh, as the node uh, that is just spawned, you can still specify like a sibling uh, jail ID, and it will have the same vnet if it's not a vnet uh, jail, and you can have a node be inside of it and it having uh, permissions to you know delegate it yeah, to. Yeah, root can children. always shoot himself in the foot. Yeah. By definition. So I'm not I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure if there is really a solution because VNets can be shared and that's the mm. problem. Mm. <laughs> so well, every VNet asking, has a jail ID, but not every jail ID has a unique uh, VNet. Yeah. Uh VNet does not have a jail ID. VNet is a, a separate structure. It's uh, jail has a VNet. VNet does not know which jail mm -hmm. has it. Yeah. Uh, repeat that just for the record. It was a which can have which a jail. Uh, jails have vnets. They, yeah, uh, yeah they uh, have vnet uh, pointers, but vnets do not have a notion of jail. They're just like a network thing. Right. No, that's a valid observation. I uh, do not. Yeah, I went through a bit of kernel code and uh, did not find a way to get <laughs> to what I want. Uh, is there a way to create a VNet without a jail from user space? Uh, I don't think so. I I did not check for that, but I did not find a... No, there is not. ...anything that does that. Yeah, because VNets are only created as part of jail creation. They are inextricably tied to their jail. We could put a back pointer if we wanted to, I suppose. But you cannot I'm put having... a back pointer because multiple jails can share a VNet. Well, you would put a back pointer to the root jail that ah, okay. uh, has the vnets. So with yeah. the other vnetted jails which inherit the vnet from their parent jail do not have a direct pointer, so they have to go up their jail parent uh, chain to find their vnet? Yeah, currently or that's the only way. Because every process inside of them has a vnet and so that it's only during yeah, process creation and uh, jail attachment that this is done. And mm -hmm. so the indexing isn't required. Yeah, I imagine that's it. The only reason it wasn't done is because no one had, had a use case for it. But uh, that also wouldn't fix it, because if you have a pointer to a jail from a VNet that uh, the root, uh, the, I don't know how to call it, the top jail for that VNet, uh, that root uh, jail still is not the only one which can create nodes, uh, these okay. uh, uh, ng hub, uh, vnet hub you nodes. Have child jails with uh, inherited networking, not yeah. alias, not uh, uh, their own vnet, then they have the same permissions to the network stack as the, the parent. Yeah, and if the child creates uh, this node, I want only it to be able to push. Uh, that node to it, its child uh, jails. Ah. Yeah. And I don't think that is uh, expressible at the moment in the system. Mm, not perfect. Not neatly and easily with existing system calls, I think. Yeah. But there may be a way to. If. Uh... <laughs> You could compare against the basically the pair of uh, the root jail of the VNet and the jail ID of the process. But I don't so know which process uh, is sending me pair. a message. I just get the message. I don't That's have uh, which process <laughs> is sending it. 
Yes. <laughs> Can you attach a file descriptor to a NetGraph message? Uh, I have not tried, but I because I'm if not you sure. could do it like on a Unix socket, because uh, then uh, if that insanity is possible, you could uh, say you have to send your process descriptor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a workaround. But however, <laughs> sorry, Mo. yeah. And also after creation, if uh, there is already a node attached to a hook, you know, after the NetGraph node creation, VNet NetGraph, uh, VNet Hub NetGraph node creation, uh, I could uh, only accept like a process file descriptor from it and not any other uh, hooks. So I would require that the first uh, connection send me uh, a process file descriptor and check its uh, jail ID and use that as my... I don't know if it's yeah. impossible to uh, attach uh, any ancillary data with file descriptors or if that's yeah. truly only Unix sockets, which is quite likely. It's yeah. just the only workaround I could imagine uh, to attach an unspoofable um, capability to uh, <laughs> a, mes <laughs> a message. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. the other ugly workaround would be to dynamically allocate a system call and create your own system call to do it. No, I don't really like that. I'd, I'd love for it to be like just a pluggable thing you can KLD load and use. Uh, that you can do. You can, uh, you can have on demand. Dynamically uh... allocated. Ah, okay, okay. I mean, system but that's... call numbers. Only the lower ones are statically allocated, and then you can have kernel modules can register new system calls. Uh, you then have to ask the kernel for the system call number, but you can. I mean, I, I thought uh, adding uh, system calls was like a bit frowned upon, and especially like dynamic ones. Uh, so I did yeah, not. Uh, if you don't route. have to, it's a heavyweight change. The other way yeah. you could do it is you could create a dummy. Uh, device and then use an octal on the device. Okay, the, yeah. But that's just... Uh, but then you need like a DevFS uh, So that involved. you can pretend you haven't added a system call. <laughs> yeah, and you need the uh, DevFS involved there and uh, yep. that's another can of worms. Well, if you don't have the DevFS, you have so many problems for networking. Yeah, okay. That's that's right. <laughs> okay, so you think you're in the right place for such other, discussion. Other, <laughs> hmm. yeah. other thoughts at this point, or do you want to? I don't know. After sipping some coffee, you know, digest it and get back. Yeah, I mean, I now have ideas of cool. uh, okay. what to test and. Uh, Thank you for this discussion. Hey, of course, you've come to the right place. And on that note, and pardon the background noise, Jan filed a bug that perhaps should be a review if it's at that point. And uh, Jamie's like, hey, someone filed a new report. Uh, Jan, would you like to describe what you're achieving with JL-E and a separator? Yeah, so JL-E, uh, so far uh, in 14.1, does not take any additional arguments except for a separator and ignores uh, the not permitted extra arguments instead of complaining about them. The main page synopsis usage all say that it takes no additional arguments, but if you give them, it just ignores them. So there is already a easy way to fix that and that is to make the arguments which are so far prohibited, meaningful, and treat them as a list of jail names, I want to uh, print, which is exactly what I implemented. And it's a small little diff, um, which is already attached. Yeah. Does this in any way go down the road of libxo and ZFS style dash O parameter, parameter, comma, parameter, whatever, or is this just a simple jail specific um, view of the world? This is just so that you can, for example, in your jails uh, 
prepare hook dump the configuration somewhere into Varun, or uh, if you do some kind of, it could be a workaround to access variables, which are normally not available from hook scripts. So that inside an exec dot something hook, which runs on the host, like prepare, uh, pre-start, post-stop, and so on, you can then use this jail-e -E to um, extract something from the jail configuration. Jamie, what's your gut first impression on that? So if you go in details. Attachment, see hill, yep. I, I think it's uh, a very low cost solution and anything lightweight, low cost, I like. That's cool. It's, it, the diff yeah. is tiny. Yeah, okay. uh, it's, let me, I'd have to reopen it. Um, that said, should this be a review rather than a bug report? Uh, yeah, I guess for various eyes. Yeah, uh, it does feel more like a review. Yeah, you're... <laughs> With what manual page updates? Nice. Okay. Yeah, and usage update, and okay. all the changes are to visual jails function, uh, and it's call side. So the existing, if you stop scrolling yep. and go back to the beginning <laughs> the bottom, of yes, the love it. Okay. show jails function, yes. uh, inside of the if block, it preserves the existing default behavior. So if arc C is, is zero or less, yep. Yep. Uh, just so that it's defined for the whole argument range, uh, it preserves the existing behavior of just dumping all non-wildcard jails. And if arc C is greater than uh, zero, it loops over all the arguments. And for each argument, it looks for a jail configuration with that name. If it doesn't find one, it bails out. And otherwise it dumps that jails configuration to stand it out. The most important use case is to just give it a single argument so that you can dump a jail configuration by name. So that review you can review. Hmm? review, review, review. Go ahead and um, I'm yeah, just yeah, okay. reading the room. Go ahead and file that as a review and let's see what's saved. Maybe we'll have some you know, various folks have comments on how to phrase the message. But yeah, if that's lightweight and straightforward, great work. Bite sized, if you will. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Anything else on so that? Or will you do the homework? Related. Or... Yes. But closely related to jail.conf. Yes. And that is sometimes you have things which, where you, for example, have a blob of JSON or XML or whatever from some other tool. You really want it to be part of your jail configuration, but you can't, uh, or a UCL config snippet, and you can't easily put that in your jail.conf. Mm -hmm. or some database query result or whatever. And for example, you want to ask your, let's say your on jail start time, I want to ask netbox for the IP address for my jail. Mm -hmm. And we have includes, but includes uh, are still static. So you have to write them out. And uh, a lot of other the modern tools, for example, Ansible, have the option of making a config file executable so that they just, if you execute them, they emit a valid configuration snippet to stand that out. And I prototyped that for the jail parser. So it opens the path as a path descriptor uh, uses fstat to check if the file is executable by the owner. Uh, if not, it does the normal thing. It opens the path with open at an o empty path and then does an fd open so that I get a struct file like the normal path and everything is back to normal. 
If not, I'll create a pipe pair um, and then run the configuration uh, with a standard out redirected into the pipe in a ch child and feed that into the parser. The question I have is, should there be any kind of uh, privilege dropping in there if the file is not owned by the current user or should it just refuse that if the, the owner is not the current user or root? Right now, I've started looking into uh, uh, if root encounters a executable config file, which is not uh, owned by root, to uh, look up the UID and then set the group, do a proper privilege drop to that user. So set up the additional group, set the, the effective group ID, effective user ID, group ID and uh, user ID to do a full privilege drop. Uh, but is that even necessary because jail configs already uh, include by definition, uh, potentially hooks which run as root in the shell. So does it make sense to distrust the script more than um, a config file which could then just feed malicious shell commands into the jail command? One does seem kind of equivalent to the other, yes. So is it really... But I can see that it makes sense to have some kind of privilege dropping support in there so that you don't have to go through because you can't, oh, well, you could use end with splitting to go through sudo or su so to do privsep if you run your database client to not run as root or something. So potentially because you use the user ID to do some kind of access control on Postgres or whatever. Uh, thinking out loud, if we do get unprivileged jails, we don't want to have this exact same conversation in the future of, oh, well, why didn't we drop privileges when we encountered that scenario? But uh, hey. You can't drop privileges unless you're rude. All right. Um, <laughs> because so that, if you can set uh, your user ID to another user, you have a problem. And you're yeah. not root for con is <laughs> Yep. Uh, would this live Sorry. in jail or elsewhere? That would live in the jail command. Aha. Uh -huh. So and then it's probably, is that proof uh, of concept in something presentable yet? Or you just Oh, uh, sure. I can, uh, if you want, I can take over the screen share. Uh, that or set up a review. Uh, it's not off, that yet ready for review, but it okay. should compile right now. And would everyone like to see that, Jamie and? Yeah, Carl? sure. You have a different yeah, idea sure. of ready for review than I do. I put the uh, most unfinished things into reviews. <laughs> yeah, well, well, ready well. to review. I mean, uh, I don't even have an exact idea which form I wanted to take. So uh, you may share. I think I am sharing. You, you are now my... sharing it. Yes, indeed. So um, here uh, I... Uh, uh, bump up the font if you can, perhaps. I can do the ideally, opposite. I can make it... Yeah. And ideally, HD resolution. Okay. What you got? Better? Yeah, beautiful. So... Um, so what I have is I refactor the opening of the included config files out into its own little helper function. And maybe better to just, oh, let's just show the result. Um, so now I will do this. And as you can see, I overwrote my path with the output from ID. And this is the shell script. It's a shell script which emits a jail.conf snippet. I just, so uh, now, how is that implemented? I wanted to make it race free, so. Um, Uh, 
as I said, I refactor the open config part uh, for, um, where it used to uh, do an F open here, it now calls this helper function, which takes the path and updates uh, a PID because I have to handle the case that the child emitted something syntactically valid and then crashed. Uh, so if the child crashes, uh, that's also an error. And what I do here is first I open the uh, path only as a path. If that already fails, uh, I can't f start anything, so I have to fail. Then I check the mode of the open path descriptor. Um, if the referenced file is uh, user executable. Um, if not, I just open it in place, making sure to reuse the file descriptor so that I'm not um, vulnerable to rename and replace attacks and stuff like that. If or race conditions, if I'm just careless. Otherwise, I set up an argument vector, um, create a pipe, and let me, sorry for anyone with a small display, but. Um, so I'd compare if the file is owned by the user currently running the jail command. If it is, all of this here is ignored. Otherwise, I look up the username for the user ID, and then set up the groups, uh, group and user ID to drop to that user. That's, yeah. Then I move over the pipe to standard out and fxec into the file descriptor. And fxec VE works without uh, having to open the path descriptor as a real file descriptor. So yeah, and the parent, this is all in the child process of a fork and the parent process just closes the right side of the pipe pair and sets a variable. And then I open that as a libc file handle, read only, which is either a normal file or a pipe. And that's it right now. And now you can have a UCL to jail.conf conversion tool if someone writes it uh, to uh, do that or have a fancy automated include tool which can, in, for example, emit a wrapper. That's one of the use cases I wanted it this for is so that I can have a little helper which uh, derives from its path uh, the basically from its base name, a jail.conf block, and then includes something. So basically, that I can have a directory, and the directory implicitly creates a jail. Does that make sense? So that basically, the j because you can't use variables in the current parser inside the uh, jail name, you or inside of includes. But with this feature, you could write your own include logic. In it. Yeah. Oracle of Jamie, any observations at this early stage? And Jan, what code are you missing? You hinted at there being uh, Right now, one. I think uh, documentation. Ah. And uh, a statement of intent kind of like, why would you do that? Yeah, that's that's the thing I'm wondering. The idea uh, of execut executable comp files in generally, I mean, I noticed a quite a small number, zero comes to mind, of executable formats, uh, configuration files for other system utilities. Uh, yeah, in the base, I don't think we have well, what about uh, auto mount maps? Can't those be executable? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So the 
Auto Mount LDAP, for example, is a as a let's see. It's a shell script that emits a config. Where you have it, an executable config file for a tool in base. Okay. And the reason here is that you want to run an LDAP query, which tells you which auto mounts are available. And the same can happen to a jail. You want to run a LDAP query, or hopefully not LDAP, a database query to tell you uh, which jails exist on this host so that you can centrally provision that, for example. Jan, what file is that for the notes? Include LDAP. Thank you. Thank you. So um, jails can face the same problem that you want them to be dynamic. Or maybe I okay. uh, want to have a, date, a local SQLite database of statically assigned jail IDs. So that on first start, the jail picks a static jail ID and then it keeps that for all time. I kind of have to do that if I wanted to support things like uh, dynamic, uh, DevFS rules because DevFS rule sets have an ID and yeah. So I kind of, for example, yeah, to uh, allocate uh, one of the use cases where I stumbled over that I can, there is no clean way to do it right now is that I have to allocate a rule set number and the rule set number is just 16 bits. But if I run, so what? Do I do about that? The lower ones are kind of blocked, so I can't let the kernel allo auto allocate my jail ID for me and hope to stay under 16 bits uh, because it's realistic over the uptime of an active build server, for example, that it will run through tens of thousands of jail IDs. If you run Pudia with a small repository definition, let's say just a few dozen ports and you frequently build that for multiple configurations, then you can quickly, within a few weeks of uptime, run through the 16-bit uh, rule set ID namespace. And when you have a JL70,000, you can't just do an identity mapping anymore. So you have to store that mapping somewhere. And then the only way to get that out of the way is to just bypass the auto allocator and assign static jail IDs. And the reason for that is that you want, for example, to run Beehive inside of uh, jails, but every Beehive jail needs a unique rule set to unhide only the devices for that Beehive instance. So that only that VMM device and uh, yeah, the VMM.io device and tab interface and so on is available in the jails devfs for Beehive to open. Okay. So that I have to have a unique devfs rule set, and those rule sets then have to be applied to a mount point. Um, you can't just modify a mount point. It looks like it, but what ha really happens is if you modify the mount point, you modify the rule set applied to the mount point because you're, yeah, there's uh, multiple mount points can reference the rule set. And if you modify the DevFS mount point, you modify its rule set, not the mount point itself. All the access control is done through the Rule sets. And yeah. So I take that as not overt hostility and uh, tentative positivity on the notion. Well, I still, uh, I don't know. It, it, it seems overkill to make it part of jail when you always have the option of having an executable 
that creates a temporary jail conf and runs jail. No, you don't. Okay. No. You can't do that from the surface jail start. Oh, well, that's true. You would have to add a service itself. that does that. But now the jail is no longer runnable on its own. It needs some other tool to be sequenced before it. And then basically you need a external driver instead of jail driving itself. Or just adding an option to the uh, JLRC saying program to run first, you know, prep script. Nah, yeah, of course I could have another RC.D script which says before colon jail. Yeah, or even that, sure. But that's not what I mean. What if I want to just do jail dash C, my jail? Then you just do <laughs> jail pro program that creates a jail conf and runs jail dash C, my jail. Yeah. So suddenly everything changes on the... It, it does, but then I, I do not see this as a major use case. I see this as a thing for some people who want to use jails. I want, for example, to be able to have a, a jail.conf I can use to run Beehive and which just works without having to run anything before and after and having to manually manage multiple files. Uh, I just want to put it in a jail conf and run the jail. Okay, and you, and you really can't get to that without the executable part then just no, for a single- No, because part okay. of yeah. it is that I have to set jail configuration parameters or variables. And so I have a, a chicken egg problem that, yes, I could use an exec dot prepare hook to, for example, load a DevFS rule set. Mm -hmm. But how do I know the rule set number to use? in my uh, jail.conf. I can't. <laughs> because at the time the executor prepares run, uh, the config is already loaded and I can't change it anymore. So do you have this you know, problem? Okay of sequencing that you have a dependency you can't resolve if you do it like that. Hopefully this vocalizing the question helps both you, Jan, mm -hmm. understand what and, you're trying to achieve and how to convince others. So I say- And the other use case is that uh, of uh, getting around the limitation that I need, uh, for example, right now I can put it in chat. Uh, so if I have this little etc jail.conf, um, this little uh, free line jail conf, and then I have something like this, and I have to template that out as a jail.conf block in my jail.conf because the jail name in this case full 14.1 P2 must be a literal. It cannot be any kind of variable because of the way the whole late name resolution, uh, late macro expansion happens, uh, which is a very useful feature to have in jail.conf but I didn't find a simple solution to allow it here because at the point where the uh, Lexa encounters the include statements uh, and the variable list isn't built and you get into the scoping issue that um, 
how would you do that at the point because you're outside of the jail block so uh, you would have to use the global scope and you probably want the name to be jail scope because otherwise what variable would you even use yeah yes yeah the problem uh stopping me from easily adding jail names into include statements right but uh, if you instead had a, a little dot include uh, which then implements its own custom include logic which emits the j just jail name open braces and then a dot include on jail name dot d slash star dot conf you could have this command emit all of that boilerplate and it would be like 10 lines of shell Well, keep hacking. Um, if uh, if this pans mm -hmm. out, it pans out. <laughs> I am not one to say. Shall we take a break from that and move on to your other question about euthanizing dying jails? Yep. Because of me looking into um, using static jail IDs above a million, so that I get out of the way of the auto allocator. Um, I noticed that sometimes yeah, if you destroy a jail, it lingers in dying state for a while. And I don't know how many conditions there are which um, can cause a jail to spend several seconds to a minute or so in dying state, which then blocks the jail ID, obviously. Uh, so that I can't reuse the jail ID immediately so that a J service jail restart fails because the uh, dying jail still blocks that. And is there anything you can do to yeah. during jail uh, shutdown to uh, make sure that you're not holding on onto any resources? Uh, killing the problem is it's a very open... Something? It's a very open-ended list of what can hold a jail open. Basically, the uh, the jail is in dying state because there is a uh, credential structure somewhere in the kernel that refers to it, and so, that could be so many things that you know, we can't we can't just say yes, let's get rid of these because of course that's what I'd like to do, but those are one-way pointers. There is no way to find out what's holding it open. We can you know go for the common cases, but we always discover new so there's things. no no way to go through all of the possible data structures which could reference then search for it and just list what's referencing it is it a socket um, is it a mount is it a process yeah. hung on an nfs uh, operation jamie go not feasibly no uh you know the, of course you know the kernel code basis a finite thing, but other than that, no. <laughs> the so, kernel, okay. <laughs> the kernel is finite, yes. <laughs> so is my lifetime. <laughs> ah. But yes, uh, okay. Uh, That's so an answer to your question. Thank <laughs> okay. you for yeah. confirming that I can give up on that. Uh, by well, the way, why is uh, jail destruction so much slower than jail creation? I noticed that uh, I can start a uh, hundred jails in a second, and destruction is like thirty or sixty seconds. Probably uh, because you're you are giving there's a pause in uh, RC dot shutdown that waits for things to die on their own, and then goes to after a bit and kills them. Uh, my, I'm, I'm not sure I'm using uh, RC shutdown. I okay, think it's not using, not using RC... anything. Yeah. Uh, so you have things like open not... TCP finish. connections. No, nothing. Just uh, I created a hundred jails and uh, destroyed them. And they're not doing anything. Then no, I don't really have an answer. Uh, they are disappearing one by one. Oh, Serial. It, it could be. Oh, are you stopping yeah. them? Uh, I'm using the tool I mentioned before, so it's. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot uh, share my screen because it's on another, another machine. But yeah, now it uh, took us 66 seconds to shut them down and uh, one second to start up. 
I could investigate and uh, report on that uh, later. And trust is your friend and other tools just to see if you can get some insights to watch it go. Team Trace is um, your real friend and for that yeah, yeah. because yeah. Uh, trust only helps you if you know which process to look at and if oh, yeah, it's not yeah, a noisy yeah. process. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have to play a bit with the trace. I have not much experience with it. But oftentimes just something higher level wrappers like uh, my favorite uh, first tool to use is the Stwatch dash X exactly E. That's fantastic, yes. Which just gives you all the exec calls which happen in the kernel with the arguments. Mm -hmm. So that you just get a stream on a loaded system, a very noisy stream of all the exec calls as they happen. Yep. And small note, it's like not smart enough. You so many a pipe. hook scripts, you can get a good idea of what's happening. Okay. I'm going to play with that then. It's one, it's super useful. Two, it will just show you piped commands as separate commands. So don't, don't assume it'll give you a exact execute command line, but it's extremely useful. Thank you, Devin, for that. And thank you, Jan, for mentioning that. Uh, is you. your friend. Okay. So um, <laughs> I noticed this in passing from the uh, TrueNAS forums. On the latest upcoming versions of TrueNAS scale, they've modified ZFS to support overlay FS. Uh, in chat during this call, Alexander Moten suggested there was a project to do maybe the probably right holes. Ba, 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 ba. And it sounds like they have maybe something for Linux that handles that. So I'll try to maybe dig a um... code on that. So if I remember correctly, what this is about is that FreeBSD's virtual file system has a dedicated file type for our so-called whiteout files, um, which is how UFS does it. But ZFS doesn't have a file type uh, to store on disk for whiteouts. So what Linux did instead is that they used uh, extended attribute out of the system namespace. Uh, if I understand correctly, that's at least one more indirection, but the uh, advantage is that it does not require a change to the um, on-disk formula. It's just an extended attribute, which is meaningless to anything which doesn't know about it, yep. it doesn't care about it, so it doesn't require a pool upgrade or anything. It's just uh, a little bit slower potentially if you mm -hmm. have a slow cache rate. As long as everything is cached, it shouldn't matter. And with that in place, they can store the information that a file is only a write out file mm -hmm. in a ZFS file system for the Linux overlay FS. Cool. So I know that came up a bunch with like. We need to get drop back in here if we can maybe get a ZFS internal overlay uh, as a new a data set type because that would be the real killer feature. Not having to go through the VFS for this, but have a, a stacking functionality within for dynamic stacking or instead of ZFS. But yeah, someone would have to fund that work. <laughs> okay. I mean, um, the exact users who wanted this would love to get a proper ZFS internal solution for that because that would be faster uh, and avoid all of the fragility of either overlay FS or even whereas FreeBSD's union FS. Hmm. It's kind of. Oh, uh, bring it up on the call. So the, we did bring it up in the ZFS call of it's good, two months in or so forms. ago with Rob. Yep. And uh, we... All oh, right, uh, he had some code from Alan he was going to poke at. Yeah, exactly. Alan yes. has already yes. looked into that. Yes. And our 
suspicion was that it would be good enough if all but the topmost element of a stack are required to be snapshots, thereby immutable, and that would vastly simplify the code because you don't have to worry about invalidation mm -hmm. because snapshot can't change. So you would just stack your snapshots and then put a, um, da a stateful data set on top of that. Um, Hopefully that would be yeah good enough. Cool. And I think for the container use case, it definitely would be. At least for all my J use cases, I can't find a use case where this isn't good enough. And that means that you don't have to worry about, oh, this V node disappeared under you. Someone sure. now you the, have the classic to deal with blow it up factor, yeah. No, no, the classic, uh, oh. now you have a dangling pointer. Oh, why didn't you have a back pointer? Oh, because that's a cyclical data structure, potentially. Oh, why don't you have a garbage collector in your kernel? Uh, yeah, I have a garbage <laughs> Go down that road. Collector. It's yeah. called panic. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Jan. Okay, well, then I will drop a quick note on the open ZFS call. And yeah, so that said, uh, Carlo, you had a question about JSON parsing, and do you mean something other than JQ? You want a library for that? Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, is JQ usable from C? Uh, uh, I, I know it's a utility, uh, like a command line utility, but I did not. I don't know. That's a I good don't question. Know if it's linkable to C and usable like that, so, I was uh, using a external uh, library for that, and I wondered if there is a. Like every, every, almost every, not almost every, a bunch of tools uh, speak uh, JSON with uh, libxo, sure. but uh, I don't know if there is a way to understand them in the base without writing a JSON there parser is. myself. Yeah, uh, libxo handles only the output. It, yeah. Among others, it supports JSON. It also supports human out, uh, formatted output and uh, XML and HTML. Um, because it was written to uh, take command line tools and bring them into web interfaces and APIs, but it's only the output. The input yes. um, in base, we have libucl. It's a okay. private a ABI, so you have to be part of base for it to be a supported use case with forward and backward compatibility as usual for you to call into it. But uh, if you're not in base and eventually want to go, just use the libucl from ports. It's a very fast and easy to use uh, JSON parser. Yeah. Okay, I will look into that. And it's uh, faster than libjson, <laughs> despite being able to parse a lot yeah. more. Not that libjson is fast, it's just, it works. Uh, um, libjson is huge and I, I did not use that. I used the, the I don't know what it's, uh, how it's pronounced, the uh, Janssen with the uh, double S, mm -hmm. J, A. Isn't and... that the one which only does lexing? Uh, it gives you the whole tree, and you can yeah, okay, it's like it it's called like that. Not just the token screen, okay. Yeah, and it's in C. It was pretty sim pretty simple to just include and link, and uh, that's why I yeah. use it. I did not know if mm -hmm. there's in tree, so I'm gonna give so in tree uh, we have the least, uh, uh, shot. libucl, um, but it's not part of a stable API or ABI of FreeBSD because it's an internal implementation detail. So that's why it calls lib private UCL because expect breakage if you link against that, potentially. Not that it happened often, but the project reserves updating that between releases without caring about compatibility, especially ABI compatibility. Yeah, okay, that, that's fine. It's a tool I'm creating for myself, and it's not uh, really a problem if yeah. it uh, breaks sometimes. I the headers are it. installed. Uh, it's not a problem to uh, compile and link against. It's just uh, the upgradability uh, question. Yeah. For example, because uh, we don't want to run into the OpenSSL updating issue here that, oh, no, uh, we made it part of the API, and now huh. we can't yeah. break the ABI. 
uh, during a minor release, but the upstream project has a new version and the security yeah. fi fixes are only in the new version. And there is no ABI compatible uh, long term support. Right. Uh, is is it uh, the same reason uh, for like uh, the lib uh, IF config? Uh, is it the same reason that they don't want to create it? Uh, they don't want mm -hmm. to uh, pronounce it like a stable? Uh, ABI and uh, lib, no uh, lib if config is even worse because lib if config um, isn't even installed. Yeah, I linked it's to it just, uh, by uh, if config statically links against it, and then that's it about. Uh, and it's not that much. It's not really what you would wish a lib if config to be. It's more like a helper for if config. Instead of IF config as an API. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was looking into having, uh, you know, like managing uh, uh, IF config stuff uh, from another tool that's not IF config, but uh, the only thing I I've could find. I've done the same. Um, yeah. uh, the project is uh, inactive right now. I did it using uh, Netlink. Ah, right. Uh, is it stable? Now? Netlink and FreeBSD, yes. Yeah, okay. I have config even and route and so on even use it uh, oh, from a right. lot of things. Um, by default in 14 and 14.1, even a few more. Um, so yeah, it's becoming ever more common to use. Yeah, that is nice. I used uh, that before, but not on FreeBSD. So the idea for my command I wanted to create is that you would have different uh, command subcommand pattern similar to Git as a command line structure, and then the output would be libxo, and it would tell you uh, if any basically the operations would each be item potent, and tell you if they changed something so that it's tooling friendly. That, that sounds so uh, similar to IP from IP route to I think. Yeah, except that uh, IP two doesn't uh, really have only add important operations. Yeah. Doesn't really tell you what changed and so on. Yeah. But and the, the uh, syntax and the output. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, the, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it I would mean, be nice to have it uh, be more uh, like similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so and the easy, more easily. hack was that uh, I used the linker set for the subcommands so the the main.c also didn't even have to change because the linker set would uh, tell uh, that it would go through, through that section and then find all the commands. And the callback structure would also contain things like the usage and help. Mm -hmm. So that you could just drop a new.c file in, compile all.c files in the directory with make, and you have a new subcommand, and the help message tells you about it and so on. Uh, go uh, ahead and so the, the email address. Scaffolding so is that. there, but um, it's so much repetitive work. No. Oh. Yeah. So, point of order, Carlos, should I add you to the invitation lists, or do you know where to find these? And would you two like oh. to talk offline? Uh, I, I don't know about them. I uh, what are they? I've not. Uh, I just send that. a weekly reminder on on these calls should you oh, well, sure, not sure. be on autopilot. So drop a, an email address yeah, in the uh, chat. I'll go from there. Okay. Um, anything else at this time? We've covered a lot of good ground. We've discussed new features. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that address. And so if that is it, I'm happy to call it at 26 after. Oh, who wants the honors? Like and subscribe. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah,